Thank you very much indeed. And uh, good morning. Lovely to see, to see you all here this morning. Thank you so much for coming along. And particularly if you've come along as a guest or because of our, our topic today or you're listening online uh, or in the future. Everyone, in other words. Uh, it's wonderful to, to have you here. I'm going to pray and just ask for God's help. Can you, first of all, can you hear me okay? Yes? Good. Don't feel embarrassed to throw your hand up if you can't hear me at some point. Uh, but let me pray as we come to think about this very, very important topic. Father, we, we thank you that we find at the heart of the New Testament the person of Jesus, and on his lips and in his life, a justice that is beyond anything we see here, uh, a justice that is wonderful, that is fair, that is restorative, and that is hopeful. So please help us as we listen and look at Jesus this morning, for we ask it in his name. Amen. The video that we just watched, of course, as Francis said, was a little introduction, thinking about the topic of, of justice. And um, I mean, from a very early age, we're very aware of justice, aren't we? I mean, I grew up with two older, ugly, I mean, older sisters who were perpetually bossing me around and telling me what to do and when to do it. And the usual cry in my family, and at least four or five days, times a day, was, it's not fair. But nobody listened. And every single day, the, the news is, you know, our TVs, our newspapers are just awash with, with, with justice, terrible stories. And it is wonderful when justice is done, but we have to say more often than not, it, it, it isn't. And there is frustration, and there is failure, and some people appear to get away with a lot of things. Think of the, 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 the Novichok victims. Um, we heard about the, the post office, the infected blood scandal, Windrush, Harrods, in the church over this last week and a half. And it's, it's always a mistake, isn't it, just to go for headlines, because behind the headlines are people like you and I, people who are often left uh, devastated by injustice, scarred, angry, hopeless. And if you've experienced that in your life to whatever degree, like I have in, in my life and in my family, you can sympathize and empathize with today's title, Justice Don't Make Me Laugh, because underneath that kind of slightly cynical title is just a loss of hope and confidence that anything could ever really get better, that sometimes there could even be any kind of healing. That this is how it's always going to be. But I want to say this morning that there is actually a, a better way to respond. These Sunday Explored series, as Francis said earlier, are, are, are an opportunity to, to ask, look, does Christianity say anything useful in any way to these big issues of, of life? And when it comes to justice, it certainly does. In a way, you'll be relieved to know it. It doesn't really primarily speak about judicial systems or political policies, as important as they are, but a person. If you were to look down at, with me, which I, I do hope you do, at verse 20 of our reading, can you see that... In 21, I beg your pardon, in his name, the nations will put their hope. Now, that sounds, may sound very odd. What on earth has someone who lived 2,000 years ago, 2,000 miles away, got to do with justice in the 21st century? The things that have happened to me, any kind of a hope? Well, this is big picture. I'll share with you three reflections which I hope are helpful. Number one, in Jesus we see true justice, true justice. Now, I don't know if you've ever been and done jury service, but apparently the jury are called the jewel in the crown of the justice system. There's a confidence in those 12 people, good and true, coming to a fair and right decision on a case. In Matthew's gospel, Jesus is the crown, in the, the, the jewel in the crown. As he eyewitnesses Jesus' life and he hears the things that Jesus says and sees how he heals all those who, who come to him and even sees the hostility of the religious establishment, 
a penny drops in Matthew's mind that he shares right here with us. He sees in Jesus' life a fulfillment of an ancient promise that God made through the prophet Isaiah. There it is in verse 18. Would you just look down with, it, with me? It says, Here is my servant whom I've chosen, the one I love in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him. In the Old Testament, a servant, this promise, was actually a leader, a, a king, but a servant king. He was filled with the spirit. It was just an indication that God was present. God was here. And he was deeply, deeply loved. That's why at Jesus' baptism, and later at his transfiguration, there's a voice from heaven that says, this is my son whom I love. Or listen to him. And so in a couple of weeks, we're going to be celebrating Christmas, the birth of this child, not some random kid in a stable, but God's own love son who comes as a servant, verse 18, to proclaim justice to the nations. Justice to the nations. That word justice here is slightly nuanced compared to verse 20. Here it describes God's righteous ethical standard for all human beings. What it would look like in a world for us to really flourish in life with each other. It's really fascinating if you look at the history of, of thought. All our basic assumptions uh, about what justice even means have come to us from Jesus' teaching. For example, that, that all human beings are equally morally valuable, men and women, that the rich and the powerful and, and the, the, the strong shouldn't trample on the, on the, on the poor and the, the weak and the oppressed and the marginalized. These things that we value most have come to us from Jesus. Jesus was once asked, what is the greatest of all these ethical standards, the, the law of God? And he said, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. To realize that, that in the other human beings, they have an innate sense of dignity and, and value and worth because they're not just a random dot in the universe, but God gave us life, made in his image to know and enjoy him. The law of love. And that was massively disruptive in Jesus' day. So he, you might know he had to tell a parable, the parable of the, the Good Samaritan, of the Jewish man walking along, was beaten up and attacked, and people just kept walking past him, his own fellow countrymen, even the religious walked straight past him. But one man stopped and picked him up and took him to an inn and healed his wounds and paid his expenses and cared for him. And who was it? It was the enemy, the most hated of the Jews, a Samaritan man, and that is the point. Jesus is saying, if you are to love and look for the best in your neighbor, it, it is those people who are not the same as you, regardless of ethnicity or the color of their skin or their age or their gender or their status in life. And that massively disrupted his day. It disrupts ours, the prejudice that lies within us. And time and again, Jesus lived and taught that law of love as he welcomed the social outcasts, the, the women who had no rights in the, 21st, in, in the first century, children who, who were thought of nothing, the sick, the poor, the broken. And he insisted that those who lead and govern and judge do so with justice and mercy and faithfulness and no longer just line their pockets and, f and work for their own power and prestige and privilege, but serve. The greatest in the kingdom, said Jesus, is the servant of all. And so here he is, proclaiming God's perfect, just standard for all human beings. Notice in verse 18, it's to all nations, regardless of where you come from in the world, regardless of your culture, regardless of who you are, everybody. And I think that rings true, doesn't it? The, 
resonates with our own hearts, our own consciences, that innate sense in us of right and wrong, because God has put it there, and now he's written it large in his son Jesus. It rings true when we cry for justice. My, my dad was very badly beaten up in the pub we ran in Richmond, and I went to see him in hospital. He had a punctured lung, broken ribs, and, and I was enraged. It's not fair. And when you cry out like that, you see, what you're doing is you're crying and appealing to a standard that is above, a standard that just can't be ignored. It resonates because God has set that standard for us. And it's right to cry. And the very basis of our whole justice system is influenced by this man, Jesus. If you go to Crown Court, and anywhere in England and Wales, you'll see the royal coat of arms. My French isn't brilliant, but underneath it says, Dieu et mon droit, God and my right. It's a reminder that the monarch, back many, many centuries, had the right under God to administer justice. God and my right. Not, not my right comes from the Greco-Roman culture, which was selfish, misogynistic, abusive, greedy, exploitative, but from God. Because in Jesus, we see true justice, the standard. But also, we see gentle restoration. I'm not going to ask you if you've been in court. Well, I have asked you, but you can tell me afterwards. I was in court, on the wrong side of court. If I'm, uh, I feel better for telling you already. When I was younger, I was quite wild, and uh, I did get into a, a, a pretty violent fight, uh, and uh, I went to trial. And uh, in between writing my, my kind of statement, my, my uh, defense, and the court date, I became, a Christ I became a Christian. And I suddenly realized that the things I'd written in my defense were basically a pack of lies to get myself off the hook. And I was conscience stricken and I was terrified going into that court. And uh, it was like meeting Judge Judy. Remember Judge Judy? Justice straight down the line. And that's what happens. The defense lawyer took my case apart. And uh, it, it was humiliating. To have met Jesus and at one level must have been quite intimidating, really. You know, perfect, righteous standing right in front of you. And, uh, but actually, it wasn't Judge Judy. It was Judge Gentle. It was Judge Gentle. Just look at verse 19. I mean, this is what blows me away. He will not quarrel or cry out, nor will hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, a smoldering wick he will snuff out. He won't snuff out. To quarrel is to pick a fight, you know, you did that to me, I'm going to do this back to you. So when the, the religious authorities tried to murder him, he just withdrew. He didn't pick a fight. He didn't cry aloud. To cry aloud is to dominate. It is, to, is kind of bully tactics. His voice wasn't heard in the street. That, that's a description of pushing yourself out there publicly. Look at me. Look at my accomplishments. Boasting, bragging. Do you remember the, uh, the famous picture of, of Putin years ago. Do you remember this? Riding on a horse, bare-chested, no shirt. The conquering warrior. But Jesus' leadership is servant leadership. Born in a stable, raised in a poor family, gentle, humble, and so compassionate. Verse 20. A bruised reed he will not break, a smoldering wick he will not snuff out, we might think, well, that, what on earth is that about? It, it's just a description of people. Imagine you're walking on a riverbank, and there are those beautiful reeds, and one is bent over and bruised and hopeless and useless and good for nothing. Can't ever be made straight again. Or a candle at the end of a, an evening, your dinner guests have gone, and the candle is, has just gone out, and there's just this, not even an ember. It, it's gone. It's, it's a picture of people. 
broken, damaged, forgotten, hated, no hope. But Jesus, Jesus met those people and he didn't snuff them out or tear them down. Instead, he made them new. It's a picture of restoration. He said, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. And they did. The tax collectors, the, the, the prostitutes, the thieves, the sick, the sad, the lonely, they came to him and they found compassion and welcome and, and restoration. And this pattern of Jesus has shaped Christian action for the past 2,000 years. Yes, it is very true that the history of the past 2,000 years has included sinful people in Jesus' name falling very short of his ethical standards, and that has to be owned, and where it's right, repented of. But it is also a history full of Christians who have set up hospitals and schools and universities and sought prison reform and uh, better housing for, for the poor and to end the slave trade, fighting for equality. It's a history full of the Wilberforces, the Nightingales, the Martin Luther Kings, and everyday Christians working for, with compassion. And we could at one level stop here. We could just stop and say, look, I want to admire this jewel, this Jesus, who who shaped our ethical standards and fulfills everything we would want for in a society, who, who teaches us to serve others with humility and compassion. And, and yes, there may be a measure of healing, uh, of change, a measure of hope. But I would be doing you a disservice because that would be to miss the most dazzling part of Jesus' justice. And it's simply this, in verse 20, victory. Victory. Verse 20. At uh, the end of verse 20. Till he brings justice to victory. Now, bear with me for a minute. That particular word, justice, here, is very specific. It means the righting of a wrong in a court of law and Jesus made it very clear that one day, every human being from all nations must stand before God at the end of all things, when all injustice will be made right and all that is sinful and evil will be removed. That day is coming, the Bible says, and no one will get away with it. And the standard by which we will be measured on that day is Jesus his perfect love for God and for one another. And on that day, there will be no court of appeal. There will be no mitigating circumstances. There will be no miscarriage of justice. And the verdict will either be eternal life with him or eternal death without him. Because God will have a world that is made new, where there is no more injustice, no more robbery, Rape, brutality, theft, hatred, none of it. A world free of pain and tears. A new creation. And his justice will have victory. But this is what is so extraordinary about Jesus. And if you forget everything else, please do not forget this. At the end of Jesus' life, what do we see? Do we see a judge with a gavel in his hand bringing down the verdict? No, we don't. We see a man on a cross. We see a man saying that he didn't come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. And in that deliberate death of Jesus' where he went and died on that brutal Roman cross, he was taking away our sins. He was bringing us forgiveness and life. And this is the true restoration for every bruised reed and, and snuffed out wick. That's why he identified with the poor and the sick. 
and the broken because he was, in fact, through his sacrifice, gathering people into his loving arms and bringing them back to relationship with God. This is his victory. And God knows our bruises. I mean, I don't know anything about your life. And I'm sure there are things that maybe very few people know about your life, the things that you've had to experience, whether in your family or at work or wherever it is. But he knows. He knows the pains and the scars. And he doesn't want us to conclude in life, justice, don't make me laugh, because there is something much better here. Verse 21, in his name, the nations will put their hope. In his name, there is healing, there is forgiveness, there is a better future. I'm going to finish now, but I'm going to finish with a, a brief story of Corrie ten Boon, a Dutch lady who, during the Second World War, was, with her entire family, put into, well, a number, actually, of German Nazi uh, concentration camps. Her entire family were killed, but she survived. And when she came out of, of the war, she wrote very honestly about her struggle with the injustice of it all. Someone told me the other day that only 10% of prison guards were ever prosecuted successfully. And she struggled with the injustice of it all uh, and with the scars and the grief. But she found actually in, in her Christian faith in Jesus, she found a, a new love and a, a, a new hope and a, a new healing. But she wrote this in the middle of her battle. She said this, if you look at the world, you will be distressed. If you look within, you will be depressed. But you look at Jesus, you'll find rest. And I take it from a lady who has suffered more than I ever will in my life. That is a very powerful testimony of how Jesus changes our hopes, our hurts, and our future. Even if nothing ever changes at the moment, one day we will share in his victory. And I hope that's a help to you. True justice gentle restoration, and ultimately victory. Now, those listening, perhaps with no Christian faith, there's a lot there, but it's a big picture of really how the Bible will begin to answer that question of justice. And I hope it gives you something to think about, to maybe pick up a conversation, to pick up a booklet and read, and Francis will say something about that in a moment. But I hope it's helpful that in his name, the notion, nations will put their hope. Shall I pray briefly? And let's finish. Dear Lord Jesus, we, we thank you that, uh, that you came to this world. You identified in the most appalling situations, helped those who were utterly broken, but most wonderfully showed your love for us at the cross, where God's perfect standards were satisfied as you died for us and offered us forgiveness in life. What a, a tremendous hope this is. And we pray that you might help us to find in you a kind and gentle Lord and Saviour. For Jesus' sake. Amen.